Uh, well, first of all, my name is Ron Blackburn Moreno. I am President and CEO of uh, SPIDA, the uh, SPIDA Association. I'm in Washington, D.C. Uh, I am originally from Puerto Rico. I was raised there, I went to school there, went to college there, and came here uh, some 20 years ago to uh, work at various or, uh, educational institutions in now Aspira. And I want to welcome you and thank you for coming to this, uh, to this panel. We, I think we have a very good panel. Let me first of all start by thanking Centro uh, for putting together this whole conference, which by the way, is probably the, the biggest gathering of Puerto Ricans and Puerto Rican leaders that I've seen in the 25 years that I've been uh, dealing with Puerto Ricans here in the United States. Uh, I also want to thank and recognize Dr. Luis O'Reyes. Uh, Dr. Reyes is here at Centro. Uh, he has an amazing body of work over decades studying education in the Puerto Rican community and he put together uh, the most recent uh, statistics on Puerto Ricans in education in the United States, in uh, uh, New York State, and in New York City. And I think he is uh, one of our uh, stellar scholars in, in the Puerto Rican community. And I thank you for coming. Uh, I'm going to present the panel and I'm, let, I'm going to let each one of them uh, present themselves and talk a little bit about themselves before we get started. So let me start here on my right, my immediate right, with Joanna Lopez, who's from Orange County in Florida, which includes Orlando. Muy buenas tardes. Primeramente, gracias. Gracias. Okay. <laughs> 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 Buenas tardes. Eh, antes que nada, quiero agradecer eh, por la invitación que me hicieron. Eh, sí, eh, he sido la maestra del año de Orange County Public School. Eh, triste y, y alegremente. <laughs> Eh, pero es la primera hispana en Orange County en tener una, eh, en Orange County en ser maestra del año. También eh, la primera hispana eh, también en ser reconocida dentro de la escuela también, aun cuando la escuela la mayoría son hispanos. Así que mi escuela, Colonial High School, tiene más de 80% latinos, más de 84% eh, low income. Eh, tenemos una comunidad bien diversa. Es la décima escuela más grande de la Florida. Es la segunda escuela más grande de Orange County Public School. Eh, y ahí, pues, doy las clases de español avanzado, literatura y lenguaje. Eh, ellos han pasado el 100% de mis estudiantes, pasan el examen con 4 y 5. Eh, y tal vez pienso, gracias, que, que el esfuerzo de los estudiantes, pues, ha sido premiado de esa manera, aunque al principio muchos de los estereotipos creados eran de que, ah, porque es español, pero no miraban el currículo de lo que es APA Literatura, que representa un, ter un tercer año universitario. Y decía yo, eh, ¿por qué no pasan a P inglés los que saben inglés? Entonces, pues estoy promoviendo la lengua, estoy hablando en español. Pienso que mientras más hablamos la lengua, más la, 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 le damos longevidad. Eh, la lengua no se debe limitar al hogar. La lengua se debe también establecer en temas intelectuales para que nuestros hijos sigan promoviendo nuestra lengua nativa, que es el español. Gracias. Uh, next is uh, Margaret Rivera, who is the board president of Aspira of Delaware and was a board president before that of Aspira of New Jersey for many, many years, been associated with the organization, Margaret. Gracias, Ron, y a mis panelistas. Yo voy a hablar en inglés y en español, porque aunque sea, no domino todavía el español como esta Esta maestra, pero no se preocupe, este, lo breve de lo mejor posible. Pero muchas gracias por esta invitación y gracias a ustedes para participar en este panel. Yo quiero hacer uno o dos comentarios este, que es bien importante. Yo siempre digo compartir información es compartir, pero lo que a mí me agrada es la conversación que se va a llevar a cabo este, en esta tarde, porque me parece que aprendemos más de la conversación de presentaciones. Pero eso este, es mi principio. Este, ha estado con la organización de Aspira más de 35 años, blup, este, o en un nivel u otro, apoyando la organización, siendo el presidenta de la Junta de la Aspira de Nueva Jersey, luego también Aspira de Delaware. Este, ha estado en la rama de educación, trabajé para una, una universidad, ha trabajado para una universidad, este, compañía telefónica, farmacéutica y ahora en recursos humanos soy consultora en el área de cumplimiento, diversidad e inclusión. Y es importante, me parece a mí, y gracias por invitarme, porque muchas veces
veces nosotros no olvidamos que vivimos en una sociedad que debemos ser incluidos. Y, me, y empiezo con nosotros, pero no se queda con nosotros, ¿verdad? Porque muchos de nosotros tenemos primos, este, nietos, algunos nietos, sobrinos y sobrinas, que entre nosotros nos hemos casado con otras personas de diferentes razas, grupos étnicos, y para mí es bien importante otra vez, este, y me agrade, este, te agradezco los comentarios de hablar su idioma, tengo sobrinos y sobrinas que la mayoría de, de su conversación es inglés, y lo entienden, pero no lo hablan. Este, pero entonces, espero nosotros, por la educación que se le da y se le va a dar a nuestros jóvenes, y le voy a dar un ejemplo más adelante en Delaware, que nosotros estamos tratando de asegurarnos que los estudiantes que vienen al estado de Delaware que retengan su propio idioma y que aprenden en su idioma a la misma vez que se aprende el inglés. Este, ha sido una luchadora voluntaria en educación toda mi vida y lo voy a hacer hasta que no haya este, discrepancias, discrepancias, discrepancias ¿verdad? entre lo que tienen y lo que no tienen, porque esa va a ser la lucha, yo creo, para mí es mundial y específicamente para nuestra población. Gracias. Eh, por último, we have uh, Roberto Sanabria, who's director of Equal Opportunity and Access at Northwestern University in Illinois. Bienvenido. Gracias. Uh, I feel that that was kind of a setup. She said she's going to speak in English and Spanish. I will, I will, I will. I will, I will. She said she did nothing but Spanish, and then she said, what, should, you're, you're proud of your nieces because they... Some, well, they, they understand, yeah. but they don't speak. speak. Okay. Yeah. I, I speak a little, but I'm not going to embarrass myself right now. Um, my, my name is Roberto Sanabria. I'm from Chicago. Um, I do speak some Spanish, but um, in fact, I used to be a Spanish teacher, so now that I've said that, I'm definitely not going to speak Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I, uh, Más alto. <laughs> Más alto, okay. I, um, I live in uh, the Puerto Rican community of Chicago, Humboldt Park, El Paseo Boricua. If you guys know those two beautiful uh, flags skirt each side of the uh, Paseo. And um, I started my career as a teacher. I was a high school teacher for many years. I taught at um, the local Chicago Public School, Roberto Clemente, for 10 years, which was a five minute walk from my house. That was a blessing. I, um, I left uh, uh, teaching in the Chicago Public Schools and uh, took on a role with the state. I became their um, affirmative action director, which meant that I would make certain that everybody played nice in the sandbox, that there was no discrimination based on protected classes such as race and sexual orientation and religion, what have you. I uh, moved on and did the same type of work at Northeastern Illinois University, which is the, at the time, was the only Hispanic serving institution in the Midwest. Now there are more. Um, Then I did the same over at Northwestern University, as the uh, compañero said that um, I was at Northwestern. I'm no longer at Northwestern. I'm, I'm surprised that I'm uh. still in my bio. I left for personal reasons. I resigned a few months ago. So um, right now I'm doing a lot of work uh, with the Puerto Rican Cultural Center. I'm on the board of directors, and I've stepped up my participation. Um, and um, I, I imagine I'm going to be back in the saddle again at another university really soon. So. Okay. Wonderful. Well, I'd like to divide this into sort of three parts um, that are interrelated, but then focus on the impact of the recent migration of Puerto Ricans from Puerto Rico to the United States. And as uh, uh, Dr. Menendez said this morning, there are two types of Puerto Ricans that are moving, some that are staying concentrated in certain areas, like in Florida, and others that are dispersing uh, across the country, which makes it, makes it for two different uh, education populations. Um, and that's what I really like to focus on. But I'd like to talk a little bit about um, uh, education in, first of all, in the United States, of Puerto Ricans in the United States. Now this is, since we don't have the disaggregated information, I'll get to that in a second, mostly about Puerto Ricans who have been here who are second and third generation Puerto Ricans. Um, and um, we know from, uh, especially from what Dr. Reyes has presented, that although there has been a, an improvement in the last 14 years, which is since data, census data, uh, in the last 14 years, there, there is uh, persistent uh, significant disparities in attainment between Puerto Rican students and non-Puerto Rican whites, and even, to a, to a certain degree, of uh, Hispanics generally, including Mexican-Americans. So there is still a significant 
disparity between those two groups. And it seems to me very um, troubling, first, uh, that after two generations or three generations, we still have that persistent uh, um, unequal uh, achievement and attainment rate uh, in the Puerto Rican community that, uh, that uh, we had uh, 40, 50 years ago. That, that seems to be uh, amazing. Um, the second is education in Puerto Rico, and because the education system in Puerto Rico is what you get when the students move to Florida. Mm -hmm. They come from Puerto Rico, and most of them will come from the Puerto Rico public education system. And finally, the impact of the recent migration uh, on, uh, of Puerto Ricans on districts like uh, Orlando and others where there are significant numbers of Puerto Rican students. So, uh, Margaret, you've been around uh, education in the United States and you've seen for the last 35, 40 years, Aspita has been around for 55, and we still, even though the gap is, is not as large, we still have an incredible gap between Puerto Rican students in terms of uh, uh, in achievement and attainment uh, and college goal mm -hmm. that we had almost 40 years ago. What do you attribute that to? Why do we have that disparity still? I think, uh, so I think it happens in waves. I think that ev every so often there's an upkick, right? An uptick mm -hmm. on progression on grade levels and then when you get other children coming into your district, into your state, then there's also now the acculturation. There is now a new educational system. Mm -hmm. Many of the individuals that will come to a state, for example, like Delaware, uh, they are individuals that are immigrants from other country for whatever political, economical, social reasons that they're coming to Delaware and that they're confronting and they're at the low poverty end. And so though there's gains that we see every so often, there also seems to be like we go back two or three steps. Like we increase, we have some years of really solid attainment, and then we have years of decreased attainment. And that, and because we make sometimes assumptions that all people are the same and they come back, they come in with either similar backgrounds, just because you speak Spanish doesn't necessarily mean mm -hmm. that you are, you've been educated to the fullest in your own country. Uh, Delaware, as you know, that there's been a migration of Honduran students and students from Guatemala, and they were dispersed throughout the entire, or throughout the United States. Mm -hmm. Delaware got 400 students, you know, it's especially in one particular county, for example. And these children, now, they're really teenagers. They're not even children, because they're unaccompanied young adults, is what they're being called. It's a strain on an educational system that, first of all, they have no parental support because they came unaccompanied. And then second of all, th that even though that they speak Spanish, a lot of them are at the fifth, sixth, seventh grade level. And they're coming in at 16, 17, and 18 years old. There's no magic wand. Label in English, I'm sorry. Huh? Label in English? Le yeah, oh. no, Spanish. That in Spanish? In Spanish. Spanish okay. um, that they come in at third and fourth grade or fifth, but they're being put in because they're young, young teenagers mm -hmm. in grades like junior year in high school, senior year, because of their age, not because of the level. But when they're coming from another country, they're coming with like no papers. And so when I say is that every once in a while there's such unique circumstances that we're always seeing gaps coming in at different times in our history. In, in the state of Delaware, and I'm only uh, now, not no, no longer New Jersey, but in the state of Delaware, since I've been there now almost 14 years, what we're also seeing is, is that there's less Puerto Ricans in the state of Delaware. The largest Hispanic concentration are Mexicans. They're about 41% of our population in terms of the Latino population. Uh, but Puerto Ricans are about 30, 31%. And the rest is Central and South Americans, when you talk about the entire Hispanic population, all at different levels of an educational system. Mm -hmm. But one thing I would like to be able to say, I don't, you don't have a magic wand, right? You just can't say the problem goes away, and it goes away in one or two years. It really does take a, an engaged community. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that we've done, and I'll make my comments really short and then I'll, I'll stop, 
One of the things that we've done, we've done two things. First of all, in the state of Delaware, there is now a Hispanic commission. This commission was put together by our current governor, Governor Markell, to be able to assist and support the Latino community and also build bridges with a lot of service-oriented organizations. And so we just got established two and a half years ago. And then this past year, er, for the last two years, we, we, we take on one task. You know how they say you just can't do, do it all? So we've agreed you can't do it all. So the first year that we had our summit, the focus was because we have such a large undocumented community in the state of Delaware, we really wanted to make sure that there were safe drivers on the road. And so we lobbied the Congress and our Senate to pass a bill, which took almost two and a half to three years, to at least allow them to get registered and have a license. Not the same license that the that the citizens of the of Delaware get, but a, le a license that permits them to get car insurance, that permits them to be able to drive safely and to be a certified driver on the road. So that was last year's battle. This year's issue is all about education. It's how do we leverage education and close the gap that currently exists, especially in low poverty areas. And of course, we make up a segment of the low poverty area. We're like 41% of that segment. And so when you, when you think about that, and then you think about the educational challenges, so what we decided to do in the state of Delaware is three prongs. We're basically really trying to eliminate achievement gaps from K to 12. One. Two, we're trying to su support academic attainment, certification, college, graduate school, whatever you want, because we make an assumption that every student has to go to college, and some students can really thrive on other certifications. And so you have to meet young people and their parents in the middle. And then the third thing that we're trying to do is really support all those individuals that are coming to the state of Delaware with limited English proficiency that are adults to encourage more programs to literally help them that will eventually help their children and understand the dynamics of our society and the educational school system. Parallel to that, the state of Delaware, eight or nine years ago, decided that they wanted to do, if they could only do one thing super really great, is to close the academic achievement gap for all of its young people. And so from birth to K to 12. All of our uh, programs that do with uh, pre-K, they all have to go through a certification. They have to be at the star quality that really teaches not only language, but cultural competencies and understanding what inclusion means. It's really, and it's gonna take us, uh, this is so interesting. So we knew that we weren't gonna do it in a year. This is a, we started this journey almost like nine to ten years ago, and our goal is by 2025, every year we get measured, by 2025, how much closer is the academic achievement gap. That also includes ensuring that you're lobbying your Congress and your Senate for the appropriate budget. And then lastly, I serve on the... I serve on so many, too many committees. <laughs> but I serve on the Department of Education Strategic Coalition for Language Learners. That is a movement in parallel with the Department of Education to ensure that those students that do come to the state of, of uh, Delaware, not only are they learning in their language and continue to learn and be proficient, but at the same time that they're meeting the academic core standards in all subject areas. So that whether you're Haitian, because we also have a pretty large Haitian community, if that Haitian community is located in one specific part of our, of our state, in a specific community, that there's at least a magnet school that will enable that young person to continue learning uh, in, his, in his or her language, which is usually French, and in some cases, sometimes French Creole, which is a difference, by the way. <laughs> Or if they're in a, a predominant um, Spanish-speaking uh, neighborhood, that there's a magnet school also that enables them to do that. So our d we're a really small state. Okay, we have less than one million people in our state. Okay, a actually about 895,000 people is in our state. So it's not a lot. So sometimes it's easier to do things in smaller states, 
But I'm of the opinion, if the vision is clear, and you set in, moment, uh, in momentum a committed and engaged community, and you rally the Latino community to support your efforts, the world is your oyster. Mm -hmm. I leave it at that. Okay. Permíteme, como es totalmente distinto en Florida, creo que debo abarcar un poco también. Trabajo en Colonial High School desde el 98. Empecé como sustituta, bueno, voluntaria sustituta maestra. Trabajaba un car wash, después un taco bueno, ¿ok? Pero vine preparada de Puerto Rico y realmente pues mi educación puertorriqueña es la que me ha ayudado a desarrollarme en Orlando. Pero lo que quiero decirle con relación a la desigualdad, que es una pregunta bien importante, cómo lograr la igualdad dentro de una escuela donde la mayoría son hispanos. Todas las escuelas pues tienen culturas distintas. En mi escuela pues somos 3.446 estudiantes, así que es mucho más grande que, que tal vez el Estado. Pero en este caso yo veía que, por ejemplo, si... si mi uh, sure. Um, for example, in the case of the AP Spanish language, I saw that the students pass 100%. I said, okay, my Hispanic students are passing the AP test. What can I do in order for them to pass the test on English, for example? ESO students, it's very hard for them to pass um, those tests, the standardized tests. For example, FCAT in Florida, now is FSA. I said, okay. Let me see, because we only have 82 students in, in Sp AP Spanish classes. We need to multiply that amount in order to make them stronger in the Spanish language. Then they can transfer their um, culture, because sometimes they speak Spanish, but only in the houses. They don't, they don't have the, back, the cultural background. They need that. And the AP giving the opportunity to develop that um, background in the native language. And I, I try to, you know, in the, during lunch, let me meet with the ESO teacher. Let me talk with the foreign language teacher. What do you think about this? What if, okay, now I need somebody to talk with the principal. Okay, let me talk with, <laughs> with my supervisor. Can you talk with the principal? Okay, he told me that it's okay. You can write, you know, the description of the course in order to have more students in AP. And they give me, gave me that, that opportunity. And from 82 students that I used to have, we had 327 recommendations for AP. Okay, for the first time. But you know, that took me maybe more than 10 years to achieve that goal, yes. okay? Yes. But for the first time, we have more than 14 um, group of students taking AP Spanish, okay? ESO students, because before, they, has not, they need to be recommended because they speak very good English. What, is that related to Spanish? No. No, they need to have a GPA of, no. They don't need that to be recommended to the AP classes. In that way, we can um, raise and, or increase um, their self-esteem also. Now they're an AP student. Now they behave mm -hmm. better, okay? Now I'm, I'm an AP, ah, because you're an AP student, you have to behave this way, you have to do this, you have to do that. You have to be part of the Hispanic honor society because you take an AP. I don't care about the GPA, okay? Even um, doing activities um, to um, reward the leadership. What is the leadership, that you have to talk a lot? No. You can be a leadership because you know, you know how to say no and know how to choose your friends. That is also a leadership. And I try to um, develop activities in Spanish because that is the only way that I can uh, attract the Hispanic community in the school because that's our first problem, that we have a barrier between the language. When I try to, with the students, they are the leaders, not me, they are. Because I said, okay, this is the problem. I need recommendations. That's the way I can develop leaders. Because if I say what they have to do, I'm not doing anything. And they said, okay, let's do a recognition night, perfect. Every parent when, will go to the, the activity that you have a recognition son. If they don't have recognition, they're not gonna go. Just to read a book, no. Okay, then we um, give them the, the leadership recognition trophies. That is just because they do something different. Maybe they have, for the first time, AP class. Maybe they're part of the club for the first time. Or maybe they are really, um, they are really a, a, a leadership in the school because they participate in different activities or they're part for different, or different clubs. Um, this is one of the, of the activities that we develop. Mm -hmm. But the last one is the voter registration. I think that we have to educate the students with the voter registration. I try to get in contact with the organization Mi Familia Vota, 
and I start in Orange County Public School for the first time of voter registration drive for five days. And we registered 545 students in the school only during lunch for five days. When they know the importance of, vo of, vo of, of, vo of the vote, they go to their house and say, you know what? We're talking about voting registration. Are you, are you registered? Because right my dad, I already registered. <laughs> if they don't know the history behind the voter registration and to be active during the election, we're not going to make any change. And we have to make them aware by talking during our um, through our classes about the voter registration. That's the only way we can make a difference to have more equality. Because if we don't know the system, we don't know how to vote, how can we get an equality? Okay. And that's it. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. Thank you. The, the lack of passion is, is amazing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess it's not very good looking, but I'm trying my best. <laughs> Uh, let me let me go back to uh, the the disparity of of the achievement and attainment of Puerto Rican students here in the in the U.S. and and Roberto, um, you were in Chicago Public Schools, and you taught at Roberto Clemente, I did. which was a, is a predominantly Puerto Rican school. It is, uh, but Roberto Clemente has has had a significant drop in enrollment in the last several years. I mean, it's a school that was built for almost 2,000 students, and today it has, what, 600? Oh, no. That? No, there's more than that. Really? It was, it was, at one time, it had more than 3,000. Right, 3,000. So it's down yeah. significantly. Uh, the, the, what have you seen in Chicago that explains why there is a persistent disparity between Puerto Rican students and non-Puerto Rican students in Chicago? Uh, uh, in terms of their educational attainment and their achievement. Is that all? all right, that's yeah. complex. The, <laughs> let, me, let me begin by saying that um, I obviously didn't get a memo. <laughs> I was asked to do a presentation on a project that the community is doing in relationship to Roberto Clemente. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be winging it right now. <laughs> so if I can talk about the um, why is there disparity? Well, well, first of all, the, you asked, you talk about why are there fewer students at Roberto Clemente, mm -hmm. and I would, um, I would blame my compañera here because a lot of them have gone to Orlando. <laughs> um, <laughs> so when I was teaching at Clemente every day, I was losing at least one student, it seemed like, and it was breaking my heart because we were sending you our best students. Oh, no. So um, I, I haven't taught at Clemente for a long time, but I, I can say that I think there's something that's universal when it comes mm -hmm. to the lack of attainment uh, of people who are marginalized, and, and that is uh, oppression, and that that's um, there, there are not enough resources in in schools, and not enough um, organized care that comes from the that that's organic, that comes from the, the bottom up. We we had had some limited successes in in Clemente uh, about a decade and a half ago, two decades ago, but that was cut short because of politics, and now I think there's a resurgence of this, but. Um, one, one of the factors, I believe, was that they started creating elite schools, mm -hmm. and some of we experienced a brain drain. Some of our best students were leaving the area. Um, when I was at Clemente for two years, I was the uh, coordinator of the bilingual program at, at Clemente. And as that, I, uh, I would go out with the counselors every now and then and go to our feeder schools. Um, one day, me and uh, a few counselors were talking to a group of eighth graders. Um, one of the eighth graders' mom had come in because she had because her son had forgotten his lunch. So she's bringing lunch to her boy. She hears that um, her boy is in a room talking to recruiters from Clemente, and it was like a novella. I mean, this woman <laughs> bust down the door. She was so dramatic. She grabbed her child, and she said, oh, no, my child will not go to Clemente. He is on the waiting list to go into Whitney Young. He's not going to go to Clemente. <laughs> Case closed. Um, the following year, I'm in the classroom, and there was a student who was in the room at that during that incident, and he told me, you know what? Um, our counselors, our uh, academic advisors at the grammar school would tell us that if you don't straighten up and fly right, you're going to go to Clemente. Oh, if yeah. you don't come to class on time all the time, you're going to wind up going to Clemente. What message is this sending? This is sending that this is, this is punishment. This is torture for you. You don't want. So Clemente, I have, you know, is our flagship school. You know how states have flagship universities? Like in my state, it's the University of Illinois at urbana -Champaign. Roberto Clemente is the flagship school in the Puerto Rican community of Chicago. 
And this was the reputation that I was getting. Parents t fought tooth and nail to keep their young people, to keep their children away from that school. So this is one of the reasons we had this, I think, internalized oppression about what we are in the institutions that we create. Thank you. Um, we'll have an opportunity for you to talk about your uh, project. <laughs> I just did a little I hope so. <laughs> uh, let me talk a little bit about the, the basis of the, the, where it all started and where it all started 40 years ago and where it is, uh, where it's starting now again, which is in the education of Puerto Rican students in Puerto Rico who are migrating. Um, I don't know if you know about uh, education, much about education in Puerto Rico. Education in Puerto Rico is uh, public education. The public education system has lost almost half of its population in the last 10 years. Uh, 20 years ago, there were almost 700,000 students in the Depart in the in, uh, Puerto Rico's public schools, which, by the way, is a unitary system. So there's a huge bureaucracy. There's one building where 5,000 people work, um, and now it's decreased to a little over 300,000 uh, students. Um, of course, it has always been a system that has lacked the resources um, that has uh, in the schools. Um, both uh, physical in terms of teachers, in terms of teaching, in terms of teaching materials. Uh, there is uh, the quality of teacher preparation in Puerto Rico, colleges and universities, which by the way, now the majority of teachers who are going into, this, into the system are being educated in schools of education at private universities, not at the University of Puerto Rico. And that's a whole other story. But uh, the, you have a poor teacher quality, a huge bureaucracy that I mentioned, um, and now you add on to that, uh, we've always had poor parental involvement because of the lack of education of the parents themselves. Um, the, the, in the private sector uh, of uh, education in Puerto Rico is also split. You have elite private schools, and then you have hundreds and hundreds of private schools that have mushroomed up to take to, because mostly of security issues. So you would send your child, even if you're a, a driver, a bus driver, you will send your child to a private school. The quality of those private schools is very much in doubt. And it's possibly worse than the education that they would get in the public school, but at least they're safe. They're most of them are faith-based, a lot of them are faith-based. So we now have a whole new uh, sector of education in Puerto Rico, which are private um, uh, private schools that are not the elite schools that traditionally we have had and that send most of the kids from the elite to elite schools in the states when they graduate. Um, in the higher education system, for those, in, for those who may not know, it, it's, it's also split between private and public. The largest university in Puerto Rico is the University of Puerto Rico, which has many campuses. And uh, over the last uh, 30 years, we've seen an, an, an enormous growth in the number of private institutions that have basically come up with the, uh, uh, that sustain themselves, mostly with federal Pell Grants. In other words, in, uh, the t cost of tuition in a private university in Puerto Rico is keyed to the maximum of a Pell Grant, which means that if the maximum that students qualify for Pell Grant was $2,100 a year, tuition at the university would be $2,100 a year. When Pell Grants went up, then the tuition would go up proportionally. So these are institutions that are basically being sustained by the federal scholarship programs. Um, the quality of these institutions, although it has improved enormously, I have to say, uh, the quality of, of many of these institutions is not um, what the University of Puerto Rico uh, is able to provide. And even there, the University of Puerto Rico has lacked resources for many, many years. Now, there are very bright spots at the University of Puerto Rico. You have the School of Medicine, which is one of the best in the Caribbean, almost free, by the way. Uh, the School of Engineering in Mayaguez, which exports more engineers than any other university in the country. Mm -hmm. um, about 70% of the engineering graduates, which is a five-year program, uh, leave Puerto Rico, because there's no job. There are no jobs, mm -hmm. and they're very well trained. Mm -hmm. So that's basically uh, the context that you have of the st where these students are coming from. Obviously, even though English is taught uh, from kindergarten up in every school, it is very rare to see a student graduating from high school that does master English, one. Second, 
over 40% of students in Puerto Rico's public schools do not finish high school to start with. That is the crop of students, that is the crop of students that is coming to uh, the U.S., that came to the U.S. 40, 50 years ago, and the same type of student that's coming uh, now. So you have the issue of you're displacing large numbers of students from one culture to another, from one language to another, from one school system to another, from one s sometimes of requirements to another. And, it's, and, and as Margie was saying, I remember one story, uh, two things. When students migrated from Puerto Rico here, um, I just remember the case of Luis Perez Jimenez. In Puerto Rico, it's Luis Perez. In Connecticut, it's Luis Jimenez, right? Records don't match. So the records in Puerto Rico and the records in Connecticut didn't match. The other, the other is that schools had no way of determining what the level of uh, achievement of the student had. There was no transfer of documents that you mentioned whereby they, these students could be assessed and properly placed. So basically, that is the situation I think that we're seeing now. The poor education in Puerto Rico, language, culture, um, and adaptation to a culture, uh, parental involvement, um, Oh, the other is th this we have to uh, attribute to uh, Educational Testing Service did a lot of research on Puerto Ricans during the, especially Luis La Osa, uh, about 20 years ago. Um, because Puerto Ricans are citizens of the U.S., they can go back and forth. And he found schools in New Jersey where students were changing schools back and forth 23 times a year. Because the parents would go back and forth. Uh, so that was uh, uh, a major issue. So based on that background, what has been your experience as a teacher in, in, in Orlando, where you have a significant number of Latino students in your school, a very large school, in probably a very segregated community, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because the community is segregated as well, um, how has the school system reacted to that? to getting so many students from a culture that is different, mm -hmm. speaking a different language, all of a sudden, at the same time, coming to the school district, to one school district. Okay, before I came um, to this event, I called uh, Rose Santiago, the, the director of multilingual um, office. She told me, we need a Spanish proficiency test in order to show the county that we have this level of student in the native language. Mm -hmm. And we have to work with them in a bilingual system because that's the only way that we can make them stronger in the native language and transfer all the knowledge to the second language. But we don't have it. We don't have that, yes. You have enough bilingual teachers. And we don't, exactly. And we only have um, the, the bilingual um, schools, we have it from kinder through, um, through third grade, that's it. So a student who comes in in fourth grade does not get uh, not their happen. education in Spanish? Exactly. In English? In English, yes. And most of our high schools um, don't have the, the ESOL and, you know, the, the segregated ESOL classes. I have it in my school, I think is better for the student, um, but most of the, of the school has the, all, everybody together, and on, only have one teacher teaching the regular English, just use, um, using the visuals for the ESOL students. I think that's so, so the kind students of arrive in, the, in this high school and it's sink or swim. They, they have no support. Yeah. Does that contribute to the dropout rate? I think, I think so, yes, but in my school, we have the ESO program. That's why we can work better with those students, you know. We have the ESO students, and we work with, um, through the AP classes. And I think that also the, the crisis in Puerto Rico is affecting our mentality when we move to the United States. Because most of, uh, of the students is, well, aquello está malo. Uh, okay, and then you're gonna finish high school and then you're gonna go, um, I don't know, because they, the only um, 
challenge is finish maybe the high school diploma, but you don't you don't see that passion that you see in the that I used to see in the country, in Puerto Rico, you know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? Maybe because of the crisis or maybe because of the situation that the student is facing with his family or her family mm -hmm. because of the economic, up, they have to survive. But the, when they come to the United States, they cannot, um, they cannot do the same profession because of the, na the language. I can say by experience, because mm -hmm. I started in the car wash and then in Taco Bell. Okay, because I didn't feel like I could do that. Okay, I have a master's degree, but I don't think that I have the right language in order to teach. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and, you know, at that point, we have a lot of barriers, not only economically, but also in our self-esteem. Sure. We have to believe that our accent is an asset mm -hmm. and that we have to believe in ourselves and we have to keep going and persevere in our dreams and we have a lot of help and opportunities um, through the system but we have to know the system that's why i emphasize the parents to be involved in the school and i have you know we have we have to develop um, a group of retired teachers a group of teachers that are willing to help um, this um, movement that's the way i call it of parent involvement and empower them to think you know what this is, this is customer service. You have to ask for a better service for your son and for mm -hmm. your children. And if you ask and you keep going and ask for the parent conference and keep going on the bureaucracy that we have, we can achieve that. Is that happening? Yes. In my case, I did it with my children. My four children are part of, the po of public school here in the United States. I have one in Boston, one in North Carolina, and now I have two in public school still, the other in the university. And with my accent, I just learn um, the LEP plan and sit down and say, I need a translator. And when I see that the translator are not doing the job, I say, she's not doing the right, she's not uh, saying the right uh, thing. <laughs> but why are you asking for a translator? Well, I understand better than what I talk, but she's not saying what I'm trying to say. <laughs> All right, you're talking about parental involvement and uh, you know how important that is. Yes. And how limited it has been because of cultural issues, because language issues, and because schools don't want the parents, or at least those parents, in the school. They're not very welcoming. What has been your experience and how do you try and break that cycle? So my situation is a little unique, so it's not also very, it's not repeated all the time. Part of it is because I, I am part of the ASPIRA organization and ASPIRA is in several of the most highly concentrated Hispanic schools in the state of Delaware. We have, um, we're fortunate that part of our curriculum that teaches young people to be advocates, to be social responsible, to acquire and attain the best education and to demonstrate leadership. While we're doing that with the students, we also take advantage of the ASPIRA Parents in Excellence Program, it's called APEX Program, where we do parental engagement. So, uh, we do talk. We do talks in conversations and discussions. So we run a Saturday academy for high school seniors and their parents. So it's, it's interesting. We first started with students, and then like the second year in, we've been doing this like for 11 years. We already said, okay, we got to involve the parents, and so we started conversations. And it's run by two psychologists. They're clinical psychologists. They're, uh, one is a family psychologist and one is a young person psychologist. So there's youth psychologists, um, which really enhances the conversations that parents have about taking a stand and being more acclimated. So we not only teach them about when your son or daughter transitions from college to high school, they bring their siblings, their, their little young you know, because mo moms and dads, they have to bring their, their kids with them because our, it's open for them. And so they begin to understand how they themselves can be empowered. And what was so unique about our experience, our parents begin, began to coach each other. And so they form circles with one another to coach mm -hmm. each other so that now it's not just Aspira uh, encouraging their support and giving them the, the really the, the nuts and bolts of how do you manage an educational system, but also telling them about their rights. So at every school in the state of Delaware where there is a, a, a group of in students that have a limited English, they're limited English, English speakers, they have the right to always have a translator there that's certified. Uh, we have that in all of our hospitals and clinics. They have a slew of them 
that they have to be certified. And so what we begin to start doing with our parents is really starting to empower them to have a voice. And when they feel that they're lonely, we kind of hook them up with another parent. And you know, there's something incredible when there's, there's force in numbers, you have a level of confidence. Mm -hmm. And that's what we've been teaching for about eight to nine years with the students. I wish we could do it even broader. We just don't have the capacity. Who knows, with the grant that we're <laughs> writing now, we might be able to do it more. But that's one of the ways that we've done that. And we have a charter school, uh, Las Americas Aspira Academy Charter School, and it's a dual language immersion. It's dual language. Whatever student comes in, non-native speaker or native speaker, the goal is by the time they're in eighth grade, they can sit for the uh, AP class in their first year and pass it with a grade of three or better, both in English and in Spanish. Uh, our school is 60, I would say 60, almost 64% Latino, and the other is not. But yet we still serve a very diverse community from students that are wealthy to people that are really getting funding from whether it's welfare or for other programs. So we're open enrollment. So we're blind enrollment, so we don't look at anything other than if you got the lottery number, you're in, regardless <laughs> of where your child is in his or her grade level. The responsibility and accountability is for our teachers to ensure that everyone graduates. And if we can have everybody on the Honor Society in eighth grade, that to us is a win. So I think it's, it's the engagement and then we're trying to replicate that in places where we don't have an Aspida organization right now. Mm -hmm. So that's what some of the, that's how we do our parent engagement. Mm -hmm. Roberto, you you mentioned a project that you were involved in, and you wanted yeah. the opportunity to talk about it. A little I would bit? love to. Yeah, I can think, I can think of a good segue too because part of the the project I want to talk about was uh, community as a campus, which is 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 really comprehensive uh, organic movement that is in Chicago, that is in Humble Park, the Puerto Rican community. And um, among the, the things that this is accomplishing is it's created what's called the Parent Popular Institute. Um, and the Parent Popular Institute is really important because it brings parents into the educational lives of their children and, and in the process. I remember, I'm going to segue uh, just a bit, I, I remember when I was teaching at Clemente, we had something um, similar to this going on. We had parents who were involved in the halls monitoring. They were actually paid to monitor. And it was so much better. There's a difference between a student being told by you know, his, the, his best friend's mom to move on because <laughs> class is starting, as opposed to somebody who looks like he's tough and wants to get in your face. So um, that, that, that program went really well. This, the parents, after the, um, a after the school day was over, many of them would um, group together and they would go into classrooms and there was some kind of an institute that was going on. These parents were getting um, ES taking ESL classes, some of them were getting GEDs, and some of them were actually linking up to city colleges inside Clemente High School and uh, on their way to get associate's degrees, which is fantastic. Now, this community as a campus concept has three legs. One of the legs is the Parent uh, Popular Institute and it's revisiting some of these things. We don't have, at the moment, parents patrolling the hallways, but there is something called the Safe Passage, which is, at, in, because I live on Clemente, uh, about five minutes walking distance from Clemente, I would see this a lot. There were fights going on on the streets. One of the problems that's going on in Chicago is that our Chicago public school system is bankrupt. They, they're paying so much money to fund the teachers' pensions that they can't afford to do anything else. Mm -hmm. Schools are closing down, and what, unfortunately what happens is they start to consolidate schools where you have students from different gangs should not be mixing together. So then you have an explosion of violence, and you wonder why. But people were telling you this is about, this is about to happen. This is about, it's happening. So um, now we have um, the, the smoke has, has settled, the dust has settled, smoke has cleared. And we have parents up and down Division Street and other streets watching the students as they go by. The violence has just plummeted. Um, and that's, that's part of it. But also, again, you have this parent institute, this parent university now, where parents are taking, again, ESL classes. Again, they're taking GED classes. They're learning financial literacy. 
Um, they, we don't have enough money yet to um, do the linkages for them to do the um, uh, get associate's degrees and bachelor's degrees, but that is in the works. Um, we've created we're, uh, a memora memorandum of understanding. We've presented it to the Chicago Public Schools. We're waiting for it to be signed, and hopefully it'll happen in the next week. Hey, well, thank you. Thank you. Um, we're gonna, I'm going to go to questions. Uh, we have about 20 minutes for uh, questions. Um, but uh, what amazed me when I was reading the, the uh, piece that uh, Dr. Reyes put together, it's called Puerto Rican Education Pipeline, New York City, New York State, and the United States. At the end, there are a series of recommendations and um, for policy changes. And these are things that he uh, recommended probably uh, many years ago when he was uh, uh, on the Commission for Education Reform here in the city of New York. I believe that's the name of the commission that issued a report uh, um, and made some recommendations situation basically the same a little better but basically the same uh, but what what amazed me are how similar the recommendations are today as they were when uh, dr reyes worked with uh, a group of people who eventually um, secured the aspira consent decree on bilingual education here in new york uh, he was instrumental in in that in that effort um, uh, one and i'm going to add one but one was we know what works I mean, we know what types of support systems are necessary and important. We know that we can expand and replicate programs, support programs that work, like ASPIRA, like many, many others. That there is a need for comprehensive bilingual education that's not only teaching students how to learn English, which may be to the detriment of their academic achievement overall and contribute to the dropout rate, but one that is that will put a path put the student on a path to, uh, achieve, to achieve as well as the other students in the school. Improve teacher education, obviously. Teacher education in this country has always been a disaster. We, we've known that. And then the, the two that I'd like to add is to develop culturally appropriate assessments. Uh, another example, remember the Juan Pérez Rodriguez example that I gave before? Well, students in, and this is again Connecticut, which I worked with for a while, they had a test, an assessment, that assessed the knowledge the students had of a lot of things before they placed them in different uh, classrooms in different grades. And one of the questions had to do with a picture of a train. At the time, Puerto Rican students who came from Puerto Rico had never seen a train. They couldn't identify a train. So a culturally appropriate assessments is one recommendation. And the other, and I just asked uh, the professor here uh, about this. I went into the uh, Orlando Public Schools or Orange County Public mm -hmm. Schools site website. There is absolutely no data, disaggregated data, on who is in that school system. So she says she has 80% of her students are Latino, probably a significant number of they Puerto Rican. They do it monthly between administrators. They don't have it public. I don't know why. <laughs> well, there's, <laughs> no, there's, public. No, there's no way we can, we can operate. So I guess before I open a question, a question, do you have any, any specific recommendation, policy recommendation that you feel is something that has really worked and something that can uh, really help the young students who are coming now? Um, with the standardized test, we have to be very careful because at this moment in Florida, for example, we are having a lot of depression on the students from elementary school to high school because they're having so many standardized tests since March until today that is, um, I think that it's, it's not good for the education, it's not good for the students, it's not good for the um, teachers. Oh. If they're gonna test, they have to, or not put in against the, their grades or not um, be a requisite to be graduate um, from high school because there's so much under pressure that for the students it's not healthy. You know, we have to do something with the standardized test. We have to to make any type of change or maybe, uh, I don't know, maybe between grades, something we have to do. Well, the new federal law will help a little bit on that. Yes, uh, Any other, and I want to go to uh, questions? Okay, questions, uh, first and second. Solution in the long run, and it would be to equalize the 
education system in the island. Because I grew up in Puerto Rico, I graduated high school in Puerto Rico in a private school. And when I came to college here, I had the level of education of a high school student. I had no idea what was going on because the curriculum in Puerto Rico, the schools are teaching you the same history for 12 years, and it's only Puerto Rican history. It's only, you know, what is pertinent to the island. So that's why you didn't know about the train. So when you come here and you want to apply to a college, you take your SATs and you fail. But then you get a really good college board exam, which is the standardized test for college in Puerto Rico. So I think if we try to equalize the standardized test so that when the students come here, it's not that big of a disparity and you can have a better flow into the education system here. Certainly, I, I totally agree, <laughs> I totally agree. You came from a private school? Mm -hmm. Even private schools. Private schools have to have the same basic curriculum as the public schools. In other words, that's, to be able to get accredited, they have to meet the same uh, have the same basic curriculum as the uh, public school in Puerto Rico. And Puerto Rico is not within, you would call the education reform movement, in other words, they haven't adopted Common Core or anything like that. Uh, they have their own curriculum, they have their own textbooks, and it, it's a Which huge system. In English. Excuse yeah, me? It's another change. In private school, yes. Because private school? Your textbooks are mainly in English, yet most of the students graduate with no English knowledge. Skills. Yes, William. I had a question, not so much on policy, but based on um, students. Uh, so I put my question is basically on student-centered learning and how, how do you empower students? So basically beyond the AP, beyond the AP and beyond state standards and measurements, how do you measure success based on state standards uh, or college prep? How do you, how do we engage with students? How do you bring their experiences in the classroom? And so I, I, know, I know a lot of comments on bilingual education, a lot of it, I know you guys are teachers, so we should be really happy to ask you guys, and uh, who, who are more on a different level as well, but um, I'm a student at Teachers College, you know, so I'm really interested in like in literacy for students, and when I think about students, uh, I went to school in Puerto Rico too in, in New York, so I'm thinking about, I, I was part of the, you know, my experiences was never seen in, in, in school, right? I was, I was a hip hop, reggaeton kid, but when I went to school, I never saw myself, and I spoke Spanglish. It was like Spanish or English. I was a very bold, you know, I'm proud of Spanglish. You know what I mean? Like, how do we, it may not be what you believe in, but how do you bring those student, how do you bring those those student experiences in the classroom that may not be reflected on a, on a state standard exam, but we know we're doing the job, that we're doing the job. So how, how do we have that conversation? Um, I, so anybody, yeah. I bring, I bring um, students, um, former students, yeah. um, that already, for example, Samuel Vilches, he graduated from Colonial High School, came from Venezuela, and in four years, he came the valedictorian of Colonial High School, getting to Princeton, you know, Bill Gates, Coca-Cola, something that they think, you know what? He get a lot of obstacles, and you see, and he just stuck with them. Or maybe uh, a student that used to be not that good in grades, but he achieved his goal, and I bring him back. For example, um, Navarrete, Felipe Navarrete, he, now he, he worked for a very um, famous company in Orlando, but he used to be a C student, but he just became a stronger student after he graduated and he talked to the students. You know, sometimes we, I brought not only the, the best of all, you know, a regular student, you know, but because they can, they can identify themselves with, with those students. Yeah, I, I don't think that there is a magic bullet, but I do think that there are some best practices. And um, I'm reminded of when I was teaching in the bilingual program at Clemente, I had, um, st I had uh, students who were, typical Puerto Rican Pentecostal girls who had skirts down to their ankles and no makeup, and they were by far the best students when it came to doing their work. They came on time, they, they aced the tests, but they never, they really didn't learn to speak English very well. I would have these kids who were my absolute worst students who hardly ever showed up to class, came at the same time from, from the island or later, and they were speaking English like this. And the reason why is because they were on the streets and they were hanging out, they're playing basketball, they're playing baseball, and they're, they're learning English. So this, this is one of the, I think, uh, concepts behind community as a campus. You're looking at your neighborhood as an intellectual space, as a place of the production of knowledge. And I think this is one way that I think educators should try to 
bring in the outside, understand that you're filled, you're sur absolutely surrounded and inundated with with people who make knowledge, and you need to respect that, and you need to bring that in. So one of the, I mentioned that the community is, at campus has three legs. One of the legs is student leadership. And in, in student leadership, we have um, programs where we have students um, talking to our elected officials, sitting down with them and think and, and discussing manners in which they can do violence reduction and the violence pr prevention, uh, substance abuse prevention, coming up with concepts of uh, how to create programs like that. They're, and when they engage in these types of activities, it's, it's a learning activity as well. They're learning how to comport them. They're learning how to think critically and organize themselves. Question back there. Your name? Oh, and where okay, you come? Sadia. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I didn't actually learn Spanish at home, so I learned it in school. Um, very, very painstakingly learned it in all throughout junior high, high school, and college. So my question is basically, as educators who work in bilingual education, do you, what do you want to see in terms of, and you, you teach AP Spanish, right? Yes. What, do you want to see those programs expanded for all students? Or would you rather focus on people like myself who were, you know, second, third generation Hispanics who didn't learn it at home? I think and how can we improve Spanish programs so more people can actually learn it at school versus they, I took seven years of Spanish and I still can't speak it. <laughs> I think for all students, and the school needs to be aware of their culture because every school have a different culture. And for example, now I'm, I'm trying to get Spanish 3 to get more Anglo into my classes. I just have three African Americans, mm -hmm. and I would love to have um, non-native in my classes because they are scared. Now I have 100% Hispanic, even, you know, Half of them may be born in the United States, but they think, no, they're Hispanic, they already know Spanish. No, and, and I feel bad, you know, and I say my, to my African-American, please help me, I need more non-native, non but I think it's for everybody, yes, I agree. The other, the other thing that I wanted to mention is that SPIDA has uh, two, actually, what we call bilingual dual immersion programs. So they are in elementary school, but uh, the purpose of the program is that by the third grade, the students will be fluent in both English and Spanish. They will start off in their native language, what, whichever that would be, and they transition into uh, the other language over the period of three to four years. So that at the end of that four year period, while they're taking their academic program, they're also learning another language. So now you have bilingual. There is an advantage in bilingualism, by the way. I mean, uh, half of this hemisphere speaks Spanish. So there is an advantage of that. Yes, you had a question. Please address it to me. I taught, I taught uh, Spanish literature in Brooklyn Tech High School. And I have some other students from Brooklyn that they were coming from first grade to, to junior high school with the dual program. And some of them are from Americans, Russians, uh, Indians. So in that program, far better than some of them. I met them yeah, in Spanish yeah. in my That's true. Right. I used to have a class in, which in, a, in a Spanish class with 25 courses, and I even have about 99% passing with five, four, mm -hmm. my AP literature. So there's no problem if you can teach Spanish yes. to, uh, to any leader at any level. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. We That's amazing. Have, you just have to have the, uh, the right program. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in the United States, the two largest teachers' unions have emerged. In tiny Puerto Rico, there are two teachers' unions. Uh, well, it, it did for a while. First of all, there's the, the, the I'll tell you the history of the teachers' unions in Puerto Rico. The, um, the Puerto Rico Teachers Association, which was a union, was, a, was the main union for many, many years. Over the course of the 60s, you had, uh, like you had radicalization here, you had it in Puerto Rico. You had a more uh, progressive uh, movement within the teachers, within the teachers' union that eventually created uh, a separate union, which is again more progressive than the old conservative union that we had from the 1930s and 40s and 50s, and became very quite aggressive, by the way, uh, and was affiliated with the AFT, with the American Federation of Teachers. The other, the uh, association, was affiliated with the, with the NEA, with the National Education Association, for many years. Uh, eventually, what happened was, in an election several years, about a decade ago, the AFT won the election for all teachers. Now, in the last administration, the 
for some technicality, the Department of Education decertified the union. So now there is no collective bargaining in the Department of Education. So there's no sort of, there, no, there is no union, per se, that has collective bargaining rights. Yeah, but they still rally around, you know, the different banners. Oh, yeah. yeah. Out, oh, yeah. Well, you know, it looks absolutely absurd when you say, uh, how are these people working with the same goals in mind when they seem to have different agendas? Yes, it's, it's totally true. I, you know, but they, the only difference is they don't have collective bargaining rights, but they do protest and they still pay dues to the union, et cetera. Well, yes. actually, they do have collective bargaining, but what happens is whatever the, the Board of Education uh, recommends, they use it and accept it, and that's what they give it to Oh, well, see. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you had a question. So I want to go back to the students that are coming in with no educational history or maybe with an intellectual disability, right? Now we, they're coming with an, an intellectual disability or perhaps an emotional disturbance. They're having to become a culture, I'm sorry. Special education. Special education. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and now they have to learn a second language. Mm -hmm. From your expertise, how can we support? How can we, what are the schools or the different states doing? Um, yeah. I happen to work in foster care, so we, we're seeing a lot of children mm -hmm. just recently migrated coming into foster care because mom left them alone because she had to go to work. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So the acculturation piece, and then we have to put them in schools, and yet, uh, so how can I support or even request that the schools do actually The school has do to do something? Yeah, of course. Right, right. The, we, well, in my case, I have an IEP plan. And we sit down with all the teachers and try to, you know, try to find what are going to be the strategies. But as a teacher, we need to be diversified in the education. We have to, um, if I have to teach five different classes at, at a time, I have to do it. You know, it's kind of magic. But sometimes, I, okay, you can see today, you know, see the year today, la la. They're not gonna know. I'm the only one who knows that that person need um, special attention, and I'm gonna take care of that person because he has or she has an IEP plan and I'm gonna make sure that I'm gonna teach that student at his level or her level. IEP is the in right. individualized right. education. Yeah, yeah, yes, 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 the, yes. The, that's a double, like sort of like a double whammy. Right, uh, yeah, you know, yeah. the, uh, in Puerto Rico, by the way, um, for those who, students who may come with disabilities, uh, special education has been under court supervision for 15, 20 years. So they uh, are disinvesting actually in the school system to invest in, in special education because they have to by court order. In, I'm sorry, in my school, monthly, we have to sit down with the person in charge of special education and make notes about that student in a mon monthly basis in Colonial High School. So my, my name is Jonathan Antoshka, and I'm, I consider myself Puerto Rican, but I'm Puerto Rican and Polish. Just finished reading um, the autobiography <laughs> from Judith Ortiz, and she talks about um, being bicultural. And so my question is, there are many families which travel back and forth to Puerto Rico and back to the homeland. Um, do you notice the rate of bicultural students increase in graduation, or do you find that it decreases? In graduation? Yeah. Wow, that's a good question. I don't have the stats right now, but that's a stat that we have in the West Side. I say that because I'm almost turning 30 years old, and I was, I'm wow. in a program where I graduate um, or I receive a GED, and education was something that was never for me. But because my family was so, my brother or sister is super successful in education, me, it just wasn't my thing. Um, and now, as an adult, I find myself just reading a lot more and being a lot more um, just integrated with education. But when it comes to those bicultural students where I was even one of those who like traveled back and forth because you had family there or you know, your dad was there for work or whatever it is, and I just didn't find the, I didn't find home because yeah. I was always exactly. back. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. We remember I mentioned, mentioned that in New Jersey they were going back and forth maybe 20 times a year changing schools. Yeah. That was a major contributor to the dropout rate because eventually you have no environment to which you've adapted to. Right. So you go to school, you go to school in Puerto Rico and it's, everything is in Spanish and you may not even go to the same school when you come, when you go back and forth. Yeah. Uh, and then you come here to a different school and you go, so you, your achievement is, is, 
is shot, basically. And it, it does correlate very, very highly with, the, even the longitudinal studies he did uh, show that the students who go back and forth uh, had a higher dropout rate than the other students who didn't. Wow. I followed the model of that. Right. <laughs> yes. I guess I wanted to um, say that, that, I mean, your, your, your comment really resonated with me, and I've been thinking a lot about this idea. A, a lot of things um, for me end up in a thread of experiential education and how uh, the idea of the, the community as a campus, the idea that for a lot of students, school doesn't resonate. It doesn't, they may be very bright, but you know, it doesn't connect with their lived experience, mm -hmm. maybe their culture. And I think of a model like El Puente in, in Brooklyn, which maybe, maybe a lot of many people know about that school that um, ended up going from like abysmal get graduation to really the community, Latino community leaders, activists taking over the school because it was so, uh, had become so uh, dysfunctional that, that the, the, you know, the city government, whatever, let them take it. And they turned it into this amazing thing where they were running the school. And they were, um, it was infused with the values of the Latinos uh, that were the students and the, also the leaders. And um, they, it involved their experience, it was portfolio based. So it's, I guess as I'm, I'm an educator and I, I guess I consider myself you know, someone who has an affinity with critical pedagogy, and how do you, you know, how, you're dealing with, so you have the dominant system, you know, the public school system, that, you know, it really, um, how do you form coalitions? How would you tell us to, you know, how do we make a difference as radical educators, yeah. or people who, um, like this uh, gentleman who, you know, extremely, brilliant, uh, but if this kind of dominant structure doesn't work, um, what, how, do you, how do you tell us to form coalitions or what can we do to, to make a difference? I'm a digital school right now, and I, it is crucial for the teachers to always make a connection with the community. It's part of, for me, it is. And I always tell them, no todo está hecho. You know, it, there's so much to do, and you might be the next Newton, the next, and, and I need something different. Today we're gonna, you know, work individually. We're gonna, what do you think we need in our school? What do you think we need in our community? But we need to um, create something to get, to, okay, create a, a lesson plan in where the student can develop something different that he thinks we need, and sometimes you, I learn from them. You know, it's a it's something that um, is a, a benefit in both directions. But the teacher needs to be humble. The teacher needs to, oh my God, I'm, I'm learning so much today from you guys. Thank you so much. And always try to to make leaders in every class and connections. Can I add okay, to, um, to that just one thing? Yeah, okay. I think it's also very critical that whoever leads a school, the administration, that has a team that believes that there is learning beyond what we teach in the classroom, and that how do you make it project-based, how do you link math with literature, yes. how do you speak critical skills with other types of skills, and how do young people teach each other, and so that it, that's what ha happens at our, our charter school. It's that it's interdisciplinary, Besides being dual language, but it's and all, and parents have the freedom any time of the day to walk in. They have an open door and an open key. They walk in and they can go. There's I'm going to this class because today I want to hear this, and they sign in. They go to the class and they're in the back of the room. Okay, I'm, I'm going to have to leave it at that because the next panel starts yeah, yeah. In, in about ten, five minutes, and I want you to all get up. Thank you so very much for joining us. Uh, we'll be around if you have any other questions. Let me know. Thank you. Thank you.